Okay, so the final type of validity that we want to talk about is this idea of external validity. Um, and this is um, making sure that your study um, is generalizable to broader populations. And so this has nothing to do with the actual internal functioning of your study, making sure there's no selection effects or attrition or other things like that. This is making sure whatever finding you have can apply to other places. Um, so are your findings generalizable to the whole population? And this is also tricky to do. Um, often in scientific experiments, you'll do an experiment on a limited sample of the population and you hope that you can roll that out to everybody and it'll have some sort of grand effect. Um, this is not limited to just social science. Um, biology does this too. You'll often see studies like this, like um, this study here from um, 2019 says that hospital lights increase the risk of dying in patients with heart disease. So policy prescription from this is dim the lights in hospitals so that people with heart disease don't die as much? Sure. Um, the issue with that, though, is this study was conducted not on humans, but on mice. Um, and so mice in a controlled laboratory situation that were given heart disease issues or who were bred for heart disease issues um, had a higher risk of dying if the lights were really bright 24-7. Which makes this policy prescription here saying dim the lights for heart attack patients, um, that probably doesn't actually apply to humans. Um, there's this really cool Twitter account here called Just Say Just Says in Mice, where it finds or whoever's running this will find a study um, that looks like it's it's something generalizable and grand, um, but it was conducted in mice, and then they'll just tweet out like this was in mice, um, and so. You might have some really cool finding, but you need to make sure it actually applies to the rest of the population. And this is kind of a big leap to make um, between mouse studies and people. Um, this is also tricky because with social science specifically, um, people who participate in studies are generally kind of different from the rest of the population. Um, one official term for them is that they are weird. Um, and that's an official term because it's actually an acronym, um, where study volunteers tend to be Western educated from industrialized, rich, and democratic countries. So the typical people that you see in studies um, will often will be like undergraduates at some university, like Harvard undergraduates participate in some lab, and then we take the findings from that study and say the whole population does this. But those are like Harvard undergraduates, which are not like the rest of the population and definitely not like the rest of the world. Um, and so trying to take um, laboratory studies on humans um, that are these weird participants and applying that to the rest of the world, that's a big leap to make. And you have to kind of justify that in your write-up of your study and say, this is why we think that this is generalizable and give good justifications for it. Um, it's also weird because um, not everybody takes surveys. If you're relying on survey um, data, which lots of you are, um, based on your um, measurement assignment, we're going to survey different um, participants in the program and measure before and after or something. Um, people who take surveys are systematically different from people who don't take surveys. Um, especially um, nowadays, there's this whole industry there's this website called Amazon Mechanical Turk, and there's a whole bunch of other similar ones where basically um, you can sign up right now if you really want um, at Mechanical Turk, and it's basically this giant list of tasks for people to do. And you can, uh, you can accept to do a task, and generally they take like three minutes, one minute, five minutes, and it's a specific thing you do, and then you get paid at the end. You get paid like 50 cents a task or 75 cents or 10 cents or whatever the task um, creator wants to pay you. And so often you can um, find people who want to complete these tasks. One of the tasks could be to fill out a survey, um, a, a survey experiment that you have. Um, I have done this in um, one of my research projects. We found um, 500 or 600 people on Amazon Turk um, to take a Qualtrics survey experiment. Um, and we we found we did a whole bunch of different stats on uh, on the survey experiment. We had created a treatment and control group. Um, it was really cool because we found those 600 people in like two hours. We listed it on on Mechanical Turk and just waited for the results to come in. And we paid everybody 75 cents for taking the survey. Um, and neat. 
But the issue there is the people who are sitting at home taking these MTurk surveys are way different from like people who don't sit at home and take MTurk surveys. Um, and so the, the segment of the population that we picked up in this survey experiment isn't necessarily reflective of the whole population. Um, this happens with um, political surveys too, this idea of random digit dialing. Um, when you're doing some sort of presidential um, approval poll or um, um, right now we have um, a presidential election um, where people are trying to find likely voters and how they're going to vote. Um, when you have situations like that, back in like the 70s, um, you could take a phone book and um, figure out kind of the main numbers, like the, the prefix there, and you could just have um, a computer spit out a whole bunch of random phone numbers and you could just dial random phone numbers and it would pick up random people throughout the city um, or throughout the state. And generally in the 70s, people answered their phones. Um, and you could find people at home during specific times. And so with random digit dialing, it was a way of trying to get a representative population or representative sample of the population. Nowadays, though, people don't have their phone numbers listed in, in uh, phone books anymore. Those aren't a thing. Um, everybody has cell phones. And nowadays, in both um, iOS and in Android, it is possible to block unknown phone numbers and have them not ring and so if you're trying to get um, a random sample of the population based on randomly dialing numbers, um, most of you probably have your phones turned off to random numbers. I, because we have all sorts of spam nowadays. So I have it that way. Like I get uh, five or six or seven or eight spam phone calls a day. Um, those might, one of those might be like a presidential approval poll or something, but I'm not going to answer. So that means these polls are picking up people who are likely to answer, um, which means it's generally older people who are still um, socially acclimated to answer the phone all the time, um, or people who just uh, don't know how to turn off that setting, um, or who are likely to just answer random phone numbers, um, essentially non-millennials um, and non-Gen Z people who don't like the phone. And so as a result, the people that you're picking up in your sample are going to be completely different from what the regular full population is. Um, and that can bias your results um, and it can make it not super generalizable. So how do you know if something is generalizable or not? Again, you can't. You have to tell a convincing story about why your volunteers who are undergraduates at some really wealthy university or why your mechanical Turk um, survey takers reflect broader trends in society. And good luck doing that. Finally, you have this idea of different settings and circumstances. And this is tricky too. You can have a really well-designed survey or really well-designed study, a program that you roll out in specific states um, or specific villages, and you have you take care of all of the internal validity issues, you track people who might um, quit the program, you take care of attrition, you take care of maturation, you do everything great. Um, at the end, you publish, you find some cool study, you find some cool result, but then you have to answer this question. Does a study in one state apply to other states? Um, for instance, right now, there's an ongoing randomized control trial in Oregon with Medicaid expansion. They used a lottery system to expand Medicaid to people who were just above the poverty line and gave them access to Medicaid, um, basically free health care. And so they've been doing all sorts of um, analysis to see what the effect of having free medical, free medical care is on a whole bunch of different outcomes. They're going to have, at the end of this study, a whole bunch of cool findings for Oregon. If you are in Rhode Island, can you take those findings from Oregon and say, we should also implement free Medicaid to everybody because of this evidence from Oregon? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, that's up to you um, to make that call and to make that connection and to see if it is applicable. Um, would that apply to Alabama? Would that apply to Texas? Would it apply to Florida? I don't know. Um, again, you have to kind of justify that. If you have some mosquito net um, program where you're trying to roll out mosquito nets to, to villages to reduce malaria infection rates, and you do an experiment in Eritrea, and you find that it works, should you then roll that out to Bolivia? I don't know. Um, even if it's a perfectly well-designed um, experiment, there's going to be systematic differences between Eritrea and Bolivia. Um, 
cultural differences, differences in malaria prevalence, differences in how people use mosquito nets, um, differences in, in public health infrastructure, um, access to medical care is going to be different in both of those contexts. And so how do you know if it's going to apply? You don't. You have to tell a convincing story and see if it'll work or just run the trial in Bolivia, which then means it's really expensive and more time consuming. But then it's more externally valid because you'll know if it works. Um, so again, with all of these situations, there's no good solution. Um, there's no magic test you can do with R to check for external validity. Um, you just have to justify it well, and it's it's mostly a, a, an issue of, of logic and philosophy and a good story and a good argument. So good luck doing that. There's no easy way to do it, but that's what has to happen.